I'm sure we'll have other people join, but in the interest of time and knowing that we have a full panel, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, Preservation Virginia CEO, and I hope each of you and your families are staying healthy and safe on this fine spring afternoon. I'm thrilled to introduce today's program and its talented panel. This webinar is part of a series of educational programming organized by Preservation Virginia. And I encourage you to visit uh, our website and our YouTube channel to explore more of that programming. Before I introduce our participants, we have a few housekeeping tips. This is a 75 minute session. We've allowed an hour for the presentations and 15 minutes for questions and wrap up. Uh, to keep to that timetable, we will hold questions to the end, but you're welcome to ask your questions at any time during our session. Just go to the, the menu bar and at the bottom of your screen, type your questions into the Q&A block. Our panelists will respond to as many questions as time allows. Um, this session is being recorded and we'll share a link of the recording early next week. If you're like me, a drive through the Virginia countryside refreshes my spirit, my outlook, and especially during this past year. As your eye scans across fields and vistas, you're sure to linger on the vernacular structures that support the work of the farm and give context to the landscapes. These iconic agricultural buildings are utilitarian by nature, but they've come to represent the independent and agrarian spirit of American life. These structures reflect the region's characters, character, customs, and are most often built for specific uses. Tobacco barns are constructed for, the curing, for curing certain types of tobacco. Other barns are intended for feed storage or to house animals or equipment. And they come in various forms of construction and scale. But with changing farm practices, inactivity of use, or other priorities for the land, these iconic structures and often the context of their landscapes fall victim to decay, dismantling, or are erased by development. Recognizing these threats, Preservation Virginia identified tobacco barns of Pennsylvania County in the 2009 list of Virginia's most endangered historic places. Our goal was not only to find ways to save these iconic structures, but also to develop models that could be replicated in other localities. Sonia Ingram led that effort to survey and document and ultimately restore 64 barns in a three county area. Preservation Virginia also has firsthand knowledge of what it takes to research, restore, and maintain historic vernacular structures from our work at our historic sites and from advising others, other owners. Sharing these efforts through blogs, videos, and workshops helps other owners understand the steps to take and gives context to their decision-making. Our session today will explore these and other programs to see how communities are preserving and reusing these structures and how individuals and groups are leading the way in developing and expanding community awareness and preservation tools. Joining us today, we have um, Deanna Peckler, Aubrey Von Lindern, John Adamson, Sonia Ingram, Eric Litchford, and Iris Holiday. Each share with will each will share with you their efforts to preserve barns across Virginia. I'll provide a brief introduction at the um, just before each speaker's segment, but be sure to check our website um, for the full listing of their experience and expertise. So first up we have D Dina. I'm Messing that up, sorry. You're quite all right. It's, um, <laughs> it's Danae, like Renee D. My mom wow. is, my mom had weirdness in mind. Don't worry, go ahead. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Danae Peckler, 
who has served on the board of directors of the National Barn Alliance since 2010 and is currently the second term uh, as president. She's contributed articles on barn preservation to an array of publications and is editor of the NBA's newsletter, The Barn Door. She works for Dovetail Cultural Resource Group in Fredericksburg, conducting architectural investigations throughout the Mid-Atlantic region and also serves on the board of Historic Fredericksburg Foundation. Danae? Thank you. All right, let me see if I can practice my savvy on technology here and get going. I should just be able to hit this present button and launch right in. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Preservation Virginia, for inviting me um, to speak on this important subject. And thank you, everyone watching, um, for your attention and interest. Um, as was mentioned, I am the current president of the National Barn Alliance. We are a nonprofit that uh, was established in 1995 um, with ties to the National Trust for Historic Preservation and their Barn Again program. Um, and we are an all volunteer board with no paid staff. So um, we, we certainly put our, our, our legs to work. Uh, our mission is really centered around um, education, documentation, advocacy, and networking um, to promote the preservation of historic barns and the, our rural heritage. Uh, we don't have much time today, so I'm gonna send you to our website to learn more. There's definitely a lot there. Oh, I think I've got a delay. Hopefully it's going to come back. There's our website, brief moment. And now moving on, all right. Maybe it'll catch up. Here we go. All right, so diving right in, why preserve barns? Why, why save our rural heritage? Um, some of the big questions uh, that we pose, what can barns and farms tell us about our past? What about the matters in the present? And which ones do we want to see preserved for the future? Um, referring to our past, uh, historic farms make for great storytellers. They're actually choose your own nonfiction adventures in my perspective. Um, and a word to the wise, I have a lot of text on these slides and I won't read it all. Um, it's largely there for when you can replay it. And if you're really interested, um, pause and watch. But I know we're, we're, on a, we're on a schedule this morning. But the best part about uh, these cultural landscapes is what we also call them in the biz, is that they, they convey a lot of trends, important trends, social trends, economic trends. Um, also traditional responses to the nature and, and illustrate land patterns that um, really shaped farming and agriculture because frankly, our agricultural history is not as well developed as our social, political, industrial and urban histories. This is something that has been so big and so influential in American life that we really haven't, um, we really haven't gotten down to the nitty gritty. So when they say research is to find out what you knew at one point, <laughs> you're researching to learn more, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and I also see um, farms in the present as heirloom art. Uh, rural heritage itself is something we inherit. Heritage is uh, from our predecessors. So I see farms like patchwork quilts. They have layers like onions um, from different periods, of course, um, which certainly makes them quite interesting. Um, and the way that they um, shape our present and into our future is that they really are heritage assets um, on our landscape. I like to think of them as cultural cash cows, um, but they provide um, incredible um, impetus for rural heritage tourism, like quilt, quilt trails and barn tours, agricultural tourism, local art, um, a sense of place and identity. They are marketing gems, not only for small businesses, but also for something as large as Hillshire Farms Meats that still thinks the barn resonates in an American mind frame. So um, they certainly support and enhance property values. And I have never, uh, I've met a lot of realtors who tell me that uh, a farm with a historic barn or an old barn sells a lot faster than one without it. So they certainly contribute to the value of our rural landscape in many ways. Um, some great barn preservation programs uh, have occurred here in Virginia. Uh, as well as elsewhere across the country. Preservation Virginia truly does stand out though, and I know Sonia is gonna talk more later about that um, as being multifaceted. Um, and I specifically loved the hands-on training workshops that really um, imbues the public with the, with the DIY spirit and barn owners um, and empowers them to, to really keep it going. Um, most of these barn preservation programs do start with documentation. Um, there's the Bedford Barns project that has also happened here in Virginia. And I know John will talk more about the Shenandoah County Barns um, that are focused on surveys. You kind of got to know what you have in order to find out what's important. Um, 
down at the bottom, I mentioned the state of Connecticut, and they actually have been hard at work at this for almost more than a decade now and have more than 8,000 barns recorded in their state. So that's um, a good success. Quickly, some frequently asked questions we get at the Barn Alliance. Is my barn worth saving? Uh, can it be saved? Yes. Any amount of money can save anything. Um, is it worth it? I, I do think so, uh, as aforementioned, for the value that it contributes to your property. Is there funding available? The short answer is um, no, not really. There are some incentives that I'll speak to briefly later, uh, but uh, ultimately, like our houses, the burden of the cost of maintenance is on the private property owner. Um, what's the most important thing you can do to protect your barn? Honestly, to keep the nice roof on it and ensure proper drainage, that does wonders. Uh, finding someone to work on your barn, you can certainly consult your SHPO and, and other people who have um, trades people's lists that are familiar with historic buildings. If it's a timber frame barn, there's the timber frame guild. But also one thing I recommend is if you see someone who's had some work done on their barn, stop and ask. Um, I think that barn owners and farmers um, are pretty good at spreading the word. So um, definitely check that out. The first thing that you can do though in any part of barn preservation or farm preservation is a little DIY research. Um, we only limit ourselves by the amount of research we're willing to invest in any um, undertaking. So learn about your barn and your farm buildings, their construction methods, and maybe some common issues. There are so many barns. Uh, a lot of people have been um, uh, you know, keeping them up for, for a while now. So I listed a few great places to look here. Um, you might also assess any money and repair work that you want to do with a long-term view. Um, you know, would $10,000 now to put roofs on these five, you know, outbuildings um, make a difference and set your farm apart in 20 years when they're still standing, you know. Um, then, of course, you can always prioritize and phase projects uh, with the biggest bang for your buck. And if it means putting on a simple metal roof now in order to just stabilize the building, well, I think that's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, I said I would briefly mention grants and condition assessments. If you are needing some serious financial assistance, it, um, there are some resources out there. A lot of public grants require a demonstration of a public benefit, so that's a little bit more of a requirement. Um, and I gave some details, but I will also throw out that I've seen some creative funding solutions like bake sales from students that saved a barn nearby, jam sessions with local musicians and a tip jar for the barn, a live nativity scene at Christmas, the, there are really countless and endless ways that, that you can um, seek to, to engage your community because of course barns are have a place in everyone's heart to at least in my opinion. Um, but there are also great things like tax incentives uh, and other benefits through conservation easements. If you are in one of Virginia's 80 plus rural historic districts, definitely consider historic tax credits. I got a great link there. Um, to an IRS document that really talks about how barns in particular can take advantage of that situation. There's also ag extension agents and local business leaders. I think it's really about the amount of research that you're willing to do. Um, there are some also localities that have tax relief programs um, that can reduce um, the burden of rehab properties as well. So uh, again, uh, always available on our website at barnalliance.org, um, but I'm definitely wanting everyone to leave this session and be an advocate for barns in, in your backyard. Uh, thank the barn owners that you know, the barns that you drive by every day. If you can, document them in some way and share that information. Um, other ways, we've just got a new barn stamp out. The National Barn Alliance um, lobbied the USPS to get a barn stamp. Um, and of course, you can join our organization and stay informed with some great tips. So. Thank you, Danae. And we put your website into the chat. So if people want to check that out now, they Thank certainly you. can. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Aubrey, Aubrey, today is not my day to pronounce, Aubrey von Lindern. Um, she has worked with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources for six years as the architectural historian for the Northern Region and as the state certified local government coordinator. She earned her master's in historic preservation from the University of Vermont and her undergraduate degree in history from Virginia Wesleyan University. She's been in historic preservation field for over 10 years, working in both the private and the public sector. Aubrey? Aubrey, you're still on mute. Gotcha, okay. 
There, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna try sharing my screen here. And can everyone see, can, can you confirm that my screen is shared? <laughs> Hello? We can see it. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Well, I wanna thank everyone for being here this afternoon and I especially want to thank Preservation Virginia for hosting this webinar for kind of what's one of, uh, personally one of my favorite building types and one that we can find in any region of the state. As the State Historic Preservation Office, DHR has some tools and programs that are here to help and encourage survey, documentation, and hopefully ultimately preservation of these important resources that I'm gonna kind of go over with you here today. One of the first steps in preservation is to really find out what is out there. And I know John will go over this a little bit later with his presentation as well. Um, and the best, best way to do this is survey and documentation of resources. For any building type, survey is the first and important step to finding out what exists in our communities, um, is the building or barn worthy of, of investment and designation and to learn more about the characteristics of the barn and its historic significance. But when you survey a building, you will want to describe the different elements of the barn, the condition, the floor plan, and other character defining features of the exterior and the interior. Uh, survey can be done by property owner uh, or preservation professional. DHR architectural historians are here, are also always available to come out and look at your barn. Um, sharing that information with DHR is also important as it will go into our the Virginia Cultural Resource Inventory System or BCRIS, an online database of all previously surveyed property, sites and structures or objects in the state. It's also important to contact us because we may have your barn already surveyed and have additional information on, on your property or um, your barn. So this slide is actually um, the Coates Barn in Madison County. You saw it in the previous slide as well. I was contacted by the owner several years ago to come out and do an assessment and help them distinguish whether or not this was a, a significant um, barn type. Um, it was ultimately listed in the National Register of Historic Places, but the first step involved going out, like I said, to take a look at the barn and do a preliminary assessment and documentation of the building. Um, on the screen is some of the information gathered during that survey. We know, found that it was a frame Gothic barn with lancet arch profile, metal roof, weatherboard siding on a concrete foundation. Um, an assessment of the interior found simply designed with elevated feed alley running down the center of the, of the ground floor and largely undestructed hay mow um, with a hay carrier and triangular wind bracing. So that's just kind of a, a sampling of what kind of information that would be um, attained during a survey. Another aspect of survey documentation is a preliminary determination of the building's significance. For the Coates Barn, which was constructed in 1949, so not a really old barn, um, but it was determined that it was significant for its architecture. As noted in the survey record, the barn had, has a lancet profile Gothic roof and a system of wind bracing that was probably modeled in part on a design published in 1935 by barn expert A.W. Holt, which was the um, documentation that you saw on the first slide. The barn stands today as a well-preserved yet dwindling barn type in Madison County, elevating its significance and making it eligible for the National Register of Historic Places and the Virginia Landmarks Register. So now that you've surveyed your barn and um, you determined its significance and determined that the barn still has historic integrity, you may want to consider getting it listed on the National Register of Historic Places and the Virginia Landmarks Register. Um, the National Register and Virginia Landmarks Register are the official listing of buildings, sites, and structures, and objects that are determined to be significant in history, architecture, archaeology, culture, and um, found usually to be worthy of preservation. Just to note, barns can be individually eligible or as a primary resource on a property or be considered as a contributing building. The name mentioned the rural historic district. So we have in a rural historic district, we have many properties, many far, or farm properties that'll have um, you know, the main house and many of the agricultural outbuildings and a barn would be uh, usually considered a, a contributing building. The barn you see here is part of what's the Bernard Gearing Farm in Shenandoah County. It was listed last, just last week on the Virginia Landmarks Register at our March board meeting. It will now be sent up to the National Park Service for approval and listed on the National Register. It is the primary resource on, the prior, on this particular property and listed for architectural significance as an early 20th century barn built partially using the pole construction method using logs as its principal posts. So it's one of the earliest of this type of construction in the county and represents a transition from earlier construction methods. 
It is also a ground barn, which is a, really a departure of, uh, from many of the barns found in the region, which are bank barns. So those are, again, some of the things you will find. And, and looking at this barn, it's, uh, you know, pretty simple on the exterior, but when you get inside, that's just a, an awesome, uh, the structure inside is just, it be, that view, is, it kind of says it all. So it's important to note that listing on the National Register of Historic Places and Virginia Landmarks Register is an honorary designation and does not create any restrictions on what property or what owners can do with their property. Additionally, listing does not require you to open your property to the public. So those are some kind of common misconceptions with the National Register and the Virginia Landmarks Register. Listing on the registers is often an important step into receiving recognition, certain financial incentives, and thorough and a thorough documentation of property. The two barns on the screen that you see here are both listed on the National Register. The one on the top is the Brown Swisher Barn in Rockbridge County, and the one on the bottom is the Homestead Dairy Complex in Bath County. As mentioned, listing on the registers may make a property eligible for both the state and federal rehabilitation tax credit programs. The rehab tax credit credits are dollar for dollar reductions in income tax liability for taxpayers who rehabilitate historic buildings. Credits are available from both the federal government and the state of Virginia. To be eligible for the federal tax credit, a building must be listed on the National Register of Historic Places and it must be income producing, a income producing property. The amount of the credit is based on total rehab costs. The federal credit is 20% of eligible rehab expenses and the state credit is 25% of rehab expenses. In some cases, taxpayers can actually qualify for under both programs. So for more information on these programs, you can go to the DHR's website and the National Park Service also has, and I think uh, this is the same brochure that Danae had posted as well, um, on the Barnes and the, uh, on Barnes and the Federal Tax Credit Program. The tax credit is a good program for stabilization and repairs if the barn meets the uh, substantial rehabilit rehabilitation test, but it can be hard for barns slated for adaptive reviews because any changes must adhere to the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehab. It is not impossible, and I would encourage you to reach out to our tax credit specialists here at H DHR to kind of uh, flesh out your, your any projects that you might have in mind or one of our architectural historians. One of the last programs I want to kind of mention that DHR has is our cost share program. DHR surveying uh, planning cost share program is available to assist usually local governments in preservation planning goals through identification of historic resources. The cost share grant can be used along with matching funds from the locality to survey and document historic resources, such as barns. These products can help local governments collect information regarding historic resources and integrate them into their long range planning goals and develop tourism programs. Because I hear agritourism is really hot right now. Um, so DHR, DHR stores all this collected information in our database, VCRIS, which I mentioned earlier, and provides ready access to resource information for local governments and other interested parties. Since 1991, survey and planning, the cost share program has actually been very successful and more than 120 communities have joined DHR to conduct 150 plus projects in every region of the Commonwealth. As a result, DHR's inventory of architectural and archeological resources has grown uh, with more than an additional 4,000 newly recorded properties. Uh, a lot of those are barns as well. Um, for more information of these programs, or DHR's programs, I encourage you to reach out to us. DHR has three regional offices, um, one in the east, central eastern region, one in the western region, and one in, up here in the north region. And as mentioned, I'm up here in the north, northern region. Um, and we, we would love, we all, all three of the regions love uh, barns, so uh, we would just jump at the chance if you have questions, if you just are if you're interested in pursuing listing, if you just want to have us come out and assess the barn, um, and any kind of tips and advice on preservation, we're willing to come out and, and do that. Um, so that's kind of a quick and dirty uh, look at what DHR has to offer. And uh, I encourage you to go to our website to look at more about our programs. Danae mentioned the easement program. That's another uh, way to preserve barns that I would uh, have you look at as well. Um, and I'm, that's, that's pretty much it for me today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I know it. We've got, we'll get lots of questions. So just as a reminder, if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A box. And now it's my pleasure to introduce John Adamson. He has had a long interest in history in general, in military, 
history in particular, and in Kentucky long rifles to be very specific. Uh, since coming to the Shen Shenandoah County in retirement from C&P Bell Atlantic Verizon, he's developed great interest in the Shenandoah County history, local architecture, and the material cult culture of the Shenandoah Valley. Currently, he's leading a program to document the barns in Shenandoah County. He is a current member of the board of directors of the Strasburg Museum and has served as past president there. He is also serves on the Shenandoah County Historical Society, Belgrove Inc. and the National Bar, Barn Alliance. John? And John, you're on mute. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Everybody does that. But, um, um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I will share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here today. My intent uh, today is simply to talk about the survey work I've been doing. And we'll go to a little... I've been surveying the barns of Shenandoah County um, for the last almost, well, three years. And um, it's, it's been a lot of fun for me, a very interesting effort and um, very homespun. Uh, but my interest in doing a survey comes from my interest in history and recognition that I live in an agricultural county whose history is dominated by agriculture, and it took me quite a while to realize that the barns in our county are probably the um, single most iconic feature of that history. Um, my intent is to get a, a picture of the entire population of historic barns in Shenandoah County. And you'll see from my work effort that I don't survey these barns with the same intensity that Aubrey mentioned when she talks about the decrease system um, but my intent is to see the whole population and I spend a little less time on each barn than you would for the level of surveying that she does. Um, the, the big reason for doing it is to preserve barns, well, to encourage the preservation of barns. Um, but I would say uh, it's been absolutely successful in preserving barns in one sense, and that is to document barns. So 270 barns have been photographed, measured, recorded in a database, and no matter what the future brings for those structures, we'll always have a record of what they looked like at the end, well, in the first two decades of the 21st century. Um, and I often tell people, I wish somebody had done this 100 years ago, but I'm doing what I can now. Um, and you can see I, each survey only takes about 20 or 30 minutes um, on site unless the owner wants to talk with you, which they usually do. Um, um, and those are very interesting conversations. Here's the team at work. I have a couple of friends that help. You can see them with their tape measure there. Um, I record a simple data for each barn, set up a folder, um, share that in several places so the data is backed up. Uh, I have a spreadsheet that encompasses all the barns I've surveyed so I can get summary statistics easily. And then um, I post each barn that I survey on a Google Maps accessible through the Shenandoah County Historical Society website. And you can click on any of those little lollipops and you can see the barn and a little bit about it. Um, my survey form is quite simple. There are many much more complex. Um, but as I said, I'm looking to get the essence of the population of the barns quickly. Um, some barns I've been back to many times, but a few, many have only seen once and uh, 20 minutes is enough. The spreadsheet looks like every spreadsheet, um, lots of numbers, but a very convenient way to summarize things. Here's the Google Maps, a screenshot of that. Each of those little uh, pins is a barn that has been surveyed, color-coded by type, 
And as I said, if you click, if you go to the website and click on those, you will see a photograph of the barn and a brief description. And this weekend, I'll do four more and they'll be on the map, added to the map before the weekend's over. Um, to date, I've done, oh, well now, a little over 270 barns and you can see some of the statistics here from what we find in Shenandoah County. Uh, suffice it to say, four bay bank barns are the dominant form here, sometimes called the Pennsylvania Standard Barn. The many, many of them were built in the decades after the Civil War and in the first two decades or three of the 20th century. There are more survivors from before the Civil War than most people uh, would believe, but um, indeed the majority are post-Civil War. Um, I was stimulated to do this somewhat by the recognition of the things that today said, the threats to barns. And we see that barns um, indeed are threatened and we lose them. Uh, this is a sort of a depressing series of slide pictures, but um, it is in fact what's going on in many places. And um, it also was what encouraged me to go survey the barns while I still can. A barn like this might not ever be preserved, but I can document it and um, get it into the database. Um, what happens when you don't do any maintenance and the barns go away? But it's not all that grim. So to close my uh, little bit today, I wanna show a couple of before and after pictures. These are all during the period of three years while I've been surveying. So a before and an after, um, in barn right across the road from me, entirely repainted and re-roofed um, to preserve it. Uh, and a couple more examples of this type of preservation. All of these I know was done at the, exp uh, at the expense of the property owner. Um, and all within the last three years. Great barn added the four bay, um, the posted four bay, it was unposted originally. So I think that barns add character and beauty to our county. That's really what the citizens of Shenandoah County would say they like about it first on almost any survey you conduct. And I just, you know, ask a rhetorical question, what would this place be like? There were no barns. And here's a, a bit of contact information if anybody wants to learn some more, our website for the Historical Society there and my personal email. Um, if anybody uh, would like to talk to me about doing a barn survey, I'm happy to share uh, my experience. And thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Preservation Virginia for inviting me to share this with you today. Um, it's been fun. Absolutely, thank you, John. I know people have questions. Um, being on the ground, is, it takes a lot of effort, um, but I think is enthusiastically welcomed. And speaking of someone who has been on the ground, Sonia Ingram is our uh, historic preservationist and archeologist with Preservation Virginia. She's been the field service manager since 2009. She helps individuals and organizations across the state protect important historic sites. Uh, Sonia manages Preservation Virginia's special projects, including our tobacco barns project that she's going to talk about, as well as our Rosenwald survey, our most endangered sites program, and is responsible for organizing today's webinar. So Sonia. Hi, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I can find it, let's see. Here, okay, sorry, it was right there before my eyes. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Preservation Virginia's Tobacco Barns program. Um, this was a regional program and it was, I, I would consider it a successful program 
Um, and also just talk a little bit about um, the use of private funding for preservation. As Elizabeth said, tobacco barns were listed on our most endangered historic places list in 2009. And that turned into a specific full program on tobacco barns that has lasted for about 10 years now. The program has had six components to it, and I'm going to very briefly go over the components, but um, we had public workshops, we had a poster contest, we, had, we did an architectural survey, we had an oral history project, we had the Route 29 barn project, and, and we also had the JT mini grants project. So I really want to talk more about the mini grants project. We, we were listed on, in Garden and Gun um, as number 33 as 50 Reasons We Love the South Now back in 2015. Um, this is just an image of some of the public workshops that we had. This is uh, an image of the poster contest. We had 63 middle, middle school students submit posters. The oral histories program, um, we interviewed 16 farmers, tobacco farmers, and created 10 short videos. And you can see all of these on our YouTube site as well. And these are just a few of the people we interviewed. Mr. Reynolds, this is uh, the Brumfield family. Um, they talked a lot about their ancestor, Julia Brunkfield, and she, uh, she actually wrote a diary of life on a tobacco farm, and you can uh, find that on the internet. You can probably just Google Julia Brunkfield diaries. Um, a couple more people that we interviewed, Billy and Imogene Johnson, and this is just a kind of a humorous photograph that, that he um, showed me that day. This is his, an image of his grandmother who was 100 years old in 1910. Elizabeth and Anderson Jones, a lovely couple who lives outside of Chatham, Virginia, and we interviewed them as well. Another part, um, another element of the program was our tobacco barn survey. This was an all-volunteer survey um, that we did. We we surveyed over 200 tobacco barns. This is just one image of some of the surveyors measuring a barn. Another barn. Um, it was a lot like John's survey. We did not get into a lot of detail, but we did um, take a lot of photographs. This, this particular barn had original wood shingles on it. We surveyed your typical curing barns, but we also surveyed what's referred to as pack barns, tobacco pack barns, and those are the ones shown on the right. The Route 29 project, this was a project uh, to repair a very visible tobacco barn on Route 29. It says Route 20 up there, but it's supposed to say 29. <laughs> and also we had a historical marker placed very close to this barn. So the JT, JTI mini grants project, after we had worked on some of these other elements for a while, we, we got in touch with a, a local tobacco company at JTI Leaf Services. They're actually an international company, but they have a large warehouse and office in Danville. And we were able to partner with them on mini grants. And this was a, a program to provide a small grants to tobacco barn owners to repair their tobacco barns in a three county region. We collaborated with a lot of historical societies and museums and civic organizations. And like Elizabeth said, we will we have 63 tobacco barns prepared by the end of this year. This is just some of the barns so let's show you some of the barns that we've done. If you go to our website, you can see a map. Here's a map of the barns and you can zoom in and click on each one and find out more information about them. These are just a couple of images, some before and after images. Some of the barns did not require a lot of work. 
Um, this is shows some an image of how we did re replace some logs. The so logs on this barn, the ones at the bottom here, were all too deteriorated and had to be replaced. This is a kind of a dramatic before and after here. And this barn was probably the most, um, the best barn that we did as far as um, we saved it. And we actually uh, replaced about 12 logs in this barn. It was, uh, it's a really early barn and um, it was definitely gonna fall down if it hadn't been in this program. We did a book about all of this that you can purchase from, if you go to our website again, you can find the book. Uh, this is another before and after of a barn in Halifax County. Another thing that we were able to do was some 3D uh, mapping. And this is that, that same barn. This is the 3D, some of the images from that. So this was able to provide us with so much information. These are just two uh, drawings that were able to be generated from that 3D mapping. This is the Hankins barn. This is um, one of the most unusual tobacco barns that I've seen. And I think probably one of the earliest ones. Um, Danae did some research for us and we did, we were able to do some 3D mapping, but unfortunately we lost this barn before we were able to repair it. This is the Porner barn. And this is one of the last ones and we're actually working on this now. And this is some of the images of the 3D mapping that was just done recently, a few weeks ago. Um, if I had time, I could go into this more and show you some of the information that this gathers, but um, I don't really have time. So this is just, I wanted to show, we were able to get grants for, for all these different parts of the, the program. Um, we had a National Trust grant for the workshops. Um, then we had some community foundation grants. We had a, as, as, um, as Aubrey was saying, we had a cost share grant from the Department of Historic Resources to do the survey. Uh, and we, but JTI Leaf Services, it's a private company, and that was the grant that really was able to push this project to a, another level to really do some bricks and mortar type repairs on these barns. It was really a, it's been a program that combines community engagement but um, also bricks and mortar type repairs and real preservation um, and some academic work as well. So, I, you know, what I wanted to say about private funding, it's unusual, but it's certainly not impossible to get funding through uh, private companies. It's, I think it's probably worthwhile to do smaller components to sort of lead up to that. Um, and I will say that JTI, they not only funded this program, but they funded a lot of other programs in the region as well. Impacts of the project, um, they haven't been easy to, to, to really be able to um, measure all of the impacts, but we have engaged over a thousand people and, and it's probably much higher than that. Uh, we collaborated with a lot of organizations. This uh, program created, up to 10 jobs for seven years uh, in, the, in, the, in the locality. We really did increase community pride. Uh, we've seen other barns not in the program being repaired. There was a real upsurge in sort of tobacco history art in the area. Um, and I think Danae mentioned there's a lot of real estate ads now that mention having a tobacco barn on their, on their property. And we also, we hope to, that people can use this project as a model for other preservation programs. So that's all that I have, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has as well. Thank you, Sonia. Um, it's really a tribute to Sonia's hard work and investment um, down in the region to have the success of this, this program. So we appreciate her efforts. Uh, next up is Eric Litchford. Eric currently manages the preservation of Preservation Virginia's eight historic sites. He's worked on several 18th and 19th century buildings across Virginia in addition to those sites. He was previously part of the architectural team at Mount Vernon. 
He hails from Alexandria and received a bachelor's degree in historic preservation from the University of Mary Washington and has really lit a fire um, in ensuring that at Preservation Virginia, our sites are, uh, the projects that we have to preserve our sites are on schedule, on budget, and um, always amaze us. So Eric. Thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some uh, ongoing preservation work we've been doing on the on a barn that's on the grounds of uh, Bacon's Castle, one of our museum sites. Um, so let me get my screen up here. All right, so this is uh, Bacon's Castle. If you're not familiar with the structure, it's the uh, oldest building in Virginia. You can see it here in the foreground. Um, but the building we're actually talking about is this one back here. Uh, just to give you a little background information on the structure, uh, we don't know the exact date it was built, um, but it has tons of architectural features that uh, very firmly place the building's construction uh, into the 18th century. Um, and we do believe that this building originally was used as a granary or a, a grain storage building, essentially. Um, just so you guys kind of understand the um, sequence of construction on this building, uh, basically the center core here and this back wing um, were built together as one unit in the 18th century. And then this front wing um, was a later addition that was added to the structure um, in the mid 19th century. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't show off a few of the building's uh, fantastic architectural features. Uh, you can see here it has this great close stud mortise and tenon timber frame. Um, the close stud spacing was done um, both to increase security on the building um, and also allow the weatherboards to be fastened tighter against insects and moisture, um, all of which are important things when you're considering uh, a building used for storing grain and agricultural goods. Um, of course, the other awesome feature of this building, when the 19th century addition was built, they placed it right over the um, exterior face of the original 18th century section of the building. Uh, and that helped preserve a lot of exterior features that don't often survive well. Here we can see we have uh, tons of 18th century hand plane beaded siding boards. Uh, these are all fastened with uh, hand wrought nails. That is, you know, nails actually forged by a blacksmith. Uh, up above that, we have the original crown molding still in place. Um, it's a pretty interesting decorative feature to have on such a utilitarian building. And then, of course, my favorite up above that, um, we have a couple courses of uh, 18th century shingles still in place. These are uh, um, riven cypress shingles. Um, they have round butts that are round ends, um, which is typical for 18th century roofs in this period. And again, these uh, shingles are attached um, with uh, hand wrought nails. So tons of uh, cool architectural features on this building, and this is just a few of them, um, but definitely you know, shows you this building is all the worthwhile for, uh, for pre pre preserving. Um, unfortunately, when uh, Preservation Virginia acquired Bacon's Castle and the surrounding outbuildings, this barn was essentially sitting on the ground, um, which is never something you want with a, uh, a timber silled structure. Um, so you can see we clearly have some damage to the sills in the form of uh, moisture from being so close to the earth and we also had uh, damage from termites and um, we did have to replace most of the sills on this building um, basically the 18th century section from here on back was done uh, mostly in the 1990s um, and then recently our present team has picked up this preservation work again, and we're doing a lot of the same work, just more focused on this front 19th century section of the building. So here, here you can see our, our preservation team working on that part of the building. Um, on the right, you can see Spencer, one of our uh, young carpenters doing some epoxy repairs. And we do take advantage of epoxy repairs when um, the repairs are smaller and uh, we can get away with using that technology um, to help consolidate um, original material. But most of the uh, work on this project has looked more like what we see on the left, um, where you'll see we basically have original vertical timbers and new sills, and a lot of the work is basically fitting uh, the original material to new material to create an overall sound structure. Um, and to do that work, we use a lot of uh, preservation techniques where our, our priority is really um, 
enabling us to preserve the maximum amount of original material. Uh, sometimes that's a pretty simple deal. So here we have, um, you know, original members fully intact. All we really have to do in this instance is cut new mortises into our new sills and the original members could be reinserted into those mortises and then uh, a peg put through them as they would have been in the 18th century. Other times though, it's a, a little bit more complex of a repair when uh, some of those vertical members have deteriorated to the point where, you know, there is nothing left to actually um, uh, put back into the uh, new sills. In that instance, we like, will use what we call a, a Dutchman repair. Um, basically, we're splicing on new lumber to the existing original timbers um, that allows them to be re-extended down to the sills um, so that the overall member has a, a positive connection both above and below. And when we're doing these types of repairs, uh, we're going to great lengths to ensure that our new material that we're adding matches the uh, size and proportion of the original material. We're making sure we are matching the specific wood species and we're making sure that um, when we're recreating the joinery, we're matching what was there originally. Um, all this is an effort to really retain as much of the integrity of the timber frame as we possibly can. <laughs> one, one of the uh, repairs I do like to talk about that we occasionally can pull off. Um, if you guys are familiar with how termites can often uh, do damage to large timbers, a lot of times they will essentially just hollow out the center of a, uh, a large wooden member and leave uh, basically a shell. Occasionally, we can take that shell and sort of reapply it over uh, new material, um, basically allowing us to keep the, uh, the exterior face of the original timber um, while giving it more structural rigidity so that it can actually go back into the building. Um, this is a, a really labor intensive process, um, but in this instance, it was actually um, very beneficial for this particular structure. Um, you can see here, this building does not have uh, floors currently. The floors that were originally in the structure were long gone by the time Preservation of Virginia uh, acquired the building. But we do have evidence that the building originally had floors um, in these joist pockets, which would have, of course held joists, which would have uh, supported floorboards. And knowing that gives us a, a better understanding of how the building was used originally, which ultimately gives us a better understanding about the people who built the structure and the people who use the building. Um, so in that case, our only evidence of actually understanding that those floors were there is these mortise pockets and um, preserving that exterior shell of that sill allowed us to retain that information uh, for future generations. Uh, lastly, I did wanna point out, we uh, did also add all these great new brick piers underneath the structure. Um, you know, doing all these timber repairs um, is, is great, but it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're not addressing the root problem, um, in our case, which, which was the, uh, the building sitting so close to the ground. Um, so we were able to also lift up the building um, and give it some breathing room from all the moisture and, uh, and uh, potentially termites down in the ground. Um, with that, though, um, there's, there's tons more to talk about as far as this restoration goes. Um, and as far as just the building in general, um, so if you do have more questions about it, be sure to uh, ask at the end. Um, and the other option is, you know, come visit Bacon's Castle. It is a museum site. It's open to the public. This building is open to the public. And we are still actively working on it, so you may get a chance to see some, uh, some really cool preservation in action. Thank you, Eric. And um, I would also say that if you're interested in seeing some of the videos, uh, you can go to our YouTube station as the team was pu puzzling out the 1701 barn and some of the mysteries around it. So it is with pleasure that I introduce our final panelists this evening, this afternoon. As a public relations practitioner, Iris Holiday recently retired from corporate life and started the IE Holiday Ideas, Strategy, and Representation. She's a graduate of Howard University and Virginia Commonwealth University and received her professional certificate in museum studies from John Tyler. Ms. Holiday is a board member of the Virginia Humanities and of the McKinney Foundation. An art collector, she believes that the richness and diversity of artists is cause for celebration and wider exposure. And for the past four years, she's represented Virginia folk artist, 
Henry Denton Rice, whose creations are now in museums and homes and offices of private collection and will be the focus of her presentation today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I apologize on behalf of the artist, Henry Denton Rice. He's 90 years old, so he joins a special club now, but his health did not permit him uh, to be present today. So he's asked me to, I guess, channel him in that respect. Um, but he is truly honored to be included. I don't have to convince anybody um, here that art is a powerful communicator of history. Um, we can see that all throughout our Commonwealth, all throughout our, our world. What is unique is that um, Mr. Rice represents a tobacco farmer who is also an artist. And with his razor sharp memory and his respect for the land and for the legacy that he was born into, and that's tobacco. Um, his parents um, gave him uh, a very, very strong work ethic. They gave him confidence and they gave him faith. Um, the muse spoke to him in 2000 after he found himself working a lot in wood, um, building houses, uh, furniture, uh, replicas of places of worship. Um, he did a replica of um, a church that was celebrating its 150th anniversary. And now he's doing a limited collection of flu cured tobacco barns. And um, we had the, the deep pleasure of hosting Sonia uh, in Preservation Virginia on his property. Um, and she has a video that aired on the Facebook page of Preservation Virginia that will give you I guess, um, a feeling for how he approaches his work. That's that 150 year old church. Mm -hmm. It is exquisite to see those pews. <laughs>
as you can see, Mr. Rice is differently able and each piece is unique. There's a different positioning of the horse and the cart, um, the whole structure of the barn. So each piece is custom made and the materials are sourced from his property. Um, it is fascinating to walk through the woods and have him say that is the perfect sapling for this barn, et cetera. Um, Growing up, I uh, asked his daughter, Dale, if there was anything in particular that he imparted to her. And I have to put into context that Mr. Rice at 90, soon to be 91, has grown up in a very um, interesting period of America's history. And we can't forget that. You know, he has witnessed post-slavery, brutal, pervasive segregation, the effects of World War I, the Great Depression, but also the advances, the astonishing advances in agriculture and industry, and the sheer force that tobacco has had on the economic well-being of our commonwealth. So Dale Rice Lewis, his daughter, said that her father does not believe in the word can't. And I think that's a, a testament uh, to him. And as you can see, he is still creating in his studio, although slowing down a tad, just a tad, um, he does not want to stop these creations. I've been very um, pleased at the public's response to acquiring those. And it, it's wonderful that more and more people are seeing them because I don't know many people, at least within the Commonwealth, who are creating the type of work that he does, but also from an artist's perspective, having the type of love for the land um, the history of tobacco and the love of family. So um, again, he is so happy that his work is being showcased, but he also wants his work to be that art uh, documentary of, of barns and their uniqueness to our landscape and their importance in terms of preservation. Thank you so much for sharing Mr. Rice's work and Please tell him that we were all excited to see it and um, wish him a happy upcoming 90th birthday when that Thank arrives. You. I, not, I might also add that his partner in this, his bride, um, Sadie Rice, is his bride of 71 years. Wow. So she's, she encourages all this wonderful art and uh, they're very modest about it, very talented. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, but well, we have a little bit of time for questions and there were several that sort of worked around this idea of uh, preservation versus rehabilitation and how you make those decisions about materials. Um, and Aubrey or uh, Eric, maybe you, one of you could talk about that. I think there's the question about some of it, how does it qualify under certain programs? Um, if it was a tax credit program and that sort of thing. But then I think it also is just goes to that decision making about if you find that there's not enough original material, how do you approach that? Well, if we, if it's for ta the tax credit program, um, it's a little different. The National Park Service has the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, and there are different levels. There's the uh, restoration or re. Rehab and restoration are two different things. I like to look at, you look at Montpelier, that is a true restoration. So that's, they, they had documented what it looked like during Madison's time and they went back to it and they used reusing uh, materials um, in, in kind. Um, so what, if they didn't have original materials, they were gonna go back, they researched. So that's a restoration versus rehab that there's a little bit more leeway. Um, versus, because obviously if you've got badly deteriorated um, materials, it's going to need to be assessed on whether or not they can be repaired versus replaced. And, and then the rehab, um, the standards say replacing kind. Um, so that's, and the tax credit program. Now, if you're not going through the tax credit program and you're just doing it yourself, you know, I encourage you um, to reach out to us uh, or reach out to any, uh, you know, somebody who's qualified to, to look at and, and kind of give you some advice. But then if you're going through the tax credit program, you're working with our tax credit specialist. And so going through those secretary of interior standards, 
um, for rehab versus restoration. Again, restoration is going to be probably more what Eric deals with <laughs> versus for Bacon's Castle, for museum houses, that type of thing. Yeah, and from my experiences, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally always trying to preserve as much of the material that dates from the significant era of whatever structure I'm working on. Um, but there is a there's a line there. Um, I know you you had a question of specifically about uh, you know like deteriorated exterior siding, um, and if that siding is let's say at a point where even repairing it's going to be a little dicey and maybe not make that siding um, as weather tight in the future, um, replacement in kind of course is something to consider, um, especially when that siding's job is to protect let's say. Um, just as historically important framing underneath it. Um, so it, it's definitely also important to consider the building holistically. Okay, thank you both. Um, John, there was a specific question about the restored barns that you showed and wondering whether they stayed in agricultural use or if they were converted for or adapted. Uh, I saw the question, so I, I peeked at uh, my program to make sure I remembered these barns. I would say generally they're in light agricultural use. It, um, in the time they were constructed, threshing of grain was typically done in the barn. That is no longer the case. So one of the major functions those barns were constructed for no longer exists in contemporary agriculture, at least not done in the barn. So, um, uh, it gives the owners a chance to do something else. They typically store hay. A few have animals um, uh, stabled in the lower levels, which is a traditional use of a bank barn. Um, obviously, equipment is stored in the barns, um, and some of it's great big uh, agricultural equipment or small tractors. And then um, I would say uh, several of the barns are being used for personal um, family type event space, and in one case, office space. An uh, office was constructed inside. So you get a variety of answers. Um, but one thing to remember is none of these barns are being used um, the way they were designed any longer because agriculture has changed. So this is sort of a question for John, Danae, and uh, Sonia. We were sort of we were talking about this before we had all of our participants join, but all of you have worked on survey projects of one type or description. And how are you received by individual bar barn property owners when you arrive to survey a barn? Well, I, I I'll start, and I uh, I brought that up. I think. Um, uh, I've said in my uh, presentation, it takes 20 to 30 minutes to survey a barn, but if the owner's present, you can count on an hour or two because you're going to talk about it. They love their barns. Um, they're interested in what I can share that increases their knowledge, um, and I'm interested in what they know about the history of their barn, so it's always a, a nice two-way conversation. Um, and um, it, locally in this, in this intensely agricultural area, um, there's a great reverence for barns and, and people, um, owners typically want to do whatever they can to preserve them. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo that. Uh, people were just very interested in having their tobacco barns surveyed. They sought us out to um, have their barn surveyed and they just had so many stories surrounding them and they wanted to share. So um, yeah, definitely people love these barns. And, and I'll throw in something about both of your surveys. I think um, both efforts um, were really well publicized and, and certainly encouraged, you know, community participation and awareness. So that certainly helps to, I think, um, to, to explain, you know, what type of information you're gathering and, and what purpose it has um, really that makes people feel comfortable. But um, I, again, what, what John said too about documentation, the fact that it, it captures a moment in time um, uh, when we don't know uh, necessarily what will be here, you know, next year. And it's very, um, it's very non-threatening. I'll just say, uh, uh, just grabbing, you know, 
um, that one glimmer of, of, of what of what exists. Um, and it really can make a difference to future researchers who, um, I mean, when you think about it, the, the rural landscape that we're looking at today is largely 20th century, uh, you know, and, and some 19th century for sure. And sometimes we get lucky enough, like Eric, to tap back into the 17th, uh, 18th century. But, um, but, but our agricultural landscape has kind of been recycled and turned over a lot. So, um, so anyway, so getting what we can uh, about this data before, um, before the 21st century further changes agricultural patterns and our rural landscape is really important. Great. Well, we can't get to all the questions, but I do want to close before I thank our panelists. Uh, one of our viewers shared a humorous story question that when she first went to visit the, ha the building that became her home, it was a log structure with a massive central chimney. Um, they saw two ponies who were sheltered in one of the back porches and she wanted to know if that qualified as a historic barn. Um, I would share that for Preservation Virginia, when we acquired Patrick Henry Scotchtown, it was used as a, a barn um, that housed goats. Um, and uh, the gentleman that owned it locally was known as the goat man. So um, I think that sometimes these structures switch their uses um, over time. But I want to thank our panelists. Um, it's really been an exciting early afternoon to hear from all of them, um, the variety of ways that barns touch our lives, both um, in sense three-dimensional sense and preserving them and understanding the history. And then as Iris pointed out with the really cultural opportunities and the art, the inspiring, the artistic side of our nature. Um, we hope you'll join more of our Preservation Virginia programs. We also hope you'll consider becoming a member. This has been an interesting year for us all with the pandemic and we're proud that uh, we've been able to keep up a full scope of programming, but that's been in part due to the contributions of our members. So please do consider that and check out our website for additional information and um, also to learn about upcoming programs. So have a good afternoon, everyone. Stay safe and thank you. Take care, thank bye. You. I'm gonna make a a pole out of this. Out of this. So if you can go over here and sit here like that. And everyone don't fit. That one I can see now is not gonna fit. I don't like the way it's shaped. Uh, Good. Oh, right. Hold on a second. So you make the notches and then it's See, I got the notches there. See how they fit there? Oh, wow. See? Yeah, you can look there. You got the flues. Flues and the burnish. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and what was this for right here? This little. Floor? Okay. This little thing where we call it here. This is where, you know, people that stay. If you see this barn and fire the back all night, mm -hmm. well, this is nothing more but get an old piece of tin and put it on and make a shade like that and, and put a. Quilt or two of the old coats on the left and there, that's the bunk. Oh, they would sleep yeah. there. Yeah, that's where you sleep there all night. Yeah. And then I so see you've got the stringing horse yeah. in there. Yeah, right here. This is the stringing horse mm -hmm. right here. Where we just string it out. And here the old horse and mule would pull that slide out of the field and bring them up down low and keep it getting up. That's right. I remember some of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.